so just so maybe a little back up a little bit, a little history on on JBL. So uh, JBL stands for James B. Lansing, and he was actually a, a radio engineer um, building uh, sp uh, speaker parts for radio. And he in the mid uh, mid 1920s. He uh, came from Salt Lake City here to Los Angeles to uh, continue on with his manufacturing pursuits because this was the hotbed for radio manufacturing in the 1920s. And uh, we're actually now at the 91st anniversary of The Jazz Singer, right? First talking movie, um, which introduced uh, uh, sound reinforcement for cinema, right? We go from pipe organ and piano uh, to talking pictures. and. Uh, so the uh, so a lot of those really early speakers were all these one-way speakers, and uh, MGM Studios so did not like the one-way speaker. They set out to put a, a collection of engineers together to figure out how to actually provide better sound in, in theaters. And, and what year was this? Um, so this is the early 1930s. So right about the same time, PA was being developed as well. Right, right, exactly. And so, um, so, so James B. Lansing was one of the engineers on the manufacturing side to go figure out. Um, on what ended up being the Shearer horn uh, in in um, in cinema, and um, the eventually the U.S. government broke up, you know, in the antitrust, they broke up Western Electric, and um, and then the sound the sound part of, of cinema needed to be broken off, and that became Altec Lansing. So eventually, James B. Lansing broke off from Altec Lansing to start JBL in 1946, but he couldn't take the word Lansing with him because it was still attached to Altec Lansing. So that 1946 was born JBL. Just after the war. Just at, just after the war. So James had carried on with um, James had carried on with the brand. He um, died a few years later. The, the the brand and the company carried on with his partners. And uh, 1969, uh, just on the heels of Woodstock, which we're on the 50th anniversary of, because JBL provided all the sound reinforcement for Woodstock. And um, that same year is when Sidney Harmon um, acquired JBL. 1969. 1969. Well, you know, from what I understand historically from some of the old timers was that, you know, there really wasn't music festivals, at least at that magnitude. So how are you going to actually amplify that sound to 100,000 you know, 100, people in a, in a field? And so JBL had to go and actually figure out how to, how to accomplish that. And Crown Amplifiers, which had not yet become a, a Harman brand at that point, um, was pro uh, was providing the power because one of the things most people don't realize is um, on cinema sound we talk about how slow sound moves in air, mm -hmm. and even if you had a you know a million watts of power at the stage, by the time it got out to a hundred yards out, it's like hello, and then you hear it. Yeah. So you have to figure out delays, you have to make lines, and then you have to figure out how to get power out to it. That was no small feat in 1969. No small feat. We've certainly come a long way. Um, you know, last year or two, we just uh, introduced our JBL VTX uh, uh, A series, which is a whole new iteration on that on those line arrays. Which uh, the the technology innovation that went into those are quite amazing. So, um, you know, smaller form factors, easier to easier to um, to transport, and just uh, bigger bigger sound, smaller form factor. Even if you're